Hi guys and welcome to this video on the least squares regression lines. This is the start of a brand new topic and couldn't be more stoked. Okay, so what do we want to learn by the end of this lesson? Uh, yeah, hold on, calm down, get a grip. So, my name's Darren, I'm a math guru. And if you are new to my channel, thank you so much for stumbling across, because uh, I don't know how you found me. Uh, the only people who are really watching these are my family. But if you're out there watching, hi, welcome, thank you so much. If you're not, and you're new, can you subscribe, let your friends know, leave comments, all those type of things. Send money, lol, just joking. And if you don't know about it, mathsguru.com has notes, free to subscribe and all those type of things in there to sort of help you time code these videos and find them a little bit easier than you can on YouTube. Okie dokie, least squares regression line. What on earth is a least squares regression line? How are we gonna use it? What's a residual? These are all things we're gonna answer. So, lines of best fit. Let's make this a little bit bigger. In previous videos, we should have been in a situation where I've said that there is generally some sort of link between some of the things we do in life. And the one example I gave here was maybe math scores and science scores. So if we say this is my math scores and here is my science scores, we would hope that, and I'm sorry this sounds horrible, but the more intelligent or the better someone is doing in math, the chances are the better they're doing in science as well. So if we were to draw some sort of graph of all the scores from some sort of group in uh, maths and science, then we may end up with something looking like that. Now at this moment in time, it's really, really hard to try and find an equation. I mean, for example, we've got all of these test scores, we, but what happens to the guy who got this test score here in maths? Well, it would appear they didn't have a test score in science. Why? Well, it could have been absent. Could have been sick on the day. I don't know. Could have vomited on the paper. Who knows what actually happened in science lessons. Could have burnt it with a Bunsen burner. Wouldn't it be good if we have some sort of way of being able to predict their science scores from their math scores? I mean, that, that would be absolutely awesome. And it's also what links explanatory variable and response variable, that ability to predict. Well, at this moment in time, using that data, fairly useless. We know that it's probably going to fit somewhere around here, but it wouldn't be good if we came up with a little bit something more accurate to be able to do this. Okay, so um, what can we actually do? Well, the great thing is we can draw a line of best fit. Now, my humor for this can't help me, but when I was back in the United Kingdom and I said, okay guys, we are going to try and draw a line of best fit between some data, and I'm just going to call it X and Y at this moment in time, Let's draw some kisses. And what I said was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's draw one more. And what I said was a line of best fit is a line where we have an equal number of crosses above and below that line. Off you go and draw one. Now thinking I was beautifully succinct and that I totally know what I was talking about, I was expecting, well, I wasn't expecting this. Somebody drew that. And I went, what are you doing? And they went, what you told me. I've got to make sure that I have an equal number of kisses above the line and below the line. Well, there we go. There's a line, equal number of kisses either side of the line. And I went, okay, here we go. Here's an A-level. Please leave my classroom. Brilliant, because they were only 11 years, of old, uh, 11 years of age. But that is not a line of best fit. Ideally, you're looking for a line that will pass through the data points, sort of going in the same direction. So in this situation, obviously that line seems to be heading upwards so that we have an equal number of data line points above the line as we do below the line. Now, that is not easy. When I was at school, we used rulers and we were trying to get it and you had some sort of rule that it always had to go through the center point or you worked out center points and blah, 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 blah. But for this course, way beyond this course. But generally speaking, we might be looking at our line of best fit looking like that. Now, you're gonna say that's not even straight. No comment, let's move on. But yes, in this situation, what do we notice? I've got one two, three points above the line, and one, two, three below the line. Yes, I had one going through here, and I think there was one going through here. Is it close? Sort of. Is it accurate? Probably not. Is there a better way of doing this? Oh yes, there is. And actually, we can use our CAS calculator, but we're going to use that more in, in a little bit. The whole point of lines of best fit, or as we call it, the least squares regression line, and I'll explain where we got that from in just a minute is that it is nothing more than a straight line. And you guys have been dealing since year nine and year 10 with straight line graphs. And with any luck, you are all guns at the idea that if you have axes labeled X, <laughs> M, nope, and Y, 
or y and x in that situation, and you have a straight line, that there is a relationship between the slope of that graph and its intercept on the x-axis. Now, a word of warning, an intercept is a very, very important term, but it's also defined as where it crosses the y-axis when the value of your x-axis is equal to zero. A lot of the graphs you're about to face in further maths will not start at zero. They will start at 3.5 or 10 or 100. But the problem is, he says, rubbing out the rest of that y-axis, that if it starts from 100, many of the graphs will be drawn to make it look like this here is the intercept. It isn't. If this value here is not zero, you cannot read off that value as your intercept. It is a huge trick. Now, obviously, in this situation here, M stands for the value of the gradient. And so we can see, as I've suggested with my equation of a straight line here, Y equals MX plus C. C is the uh, y-axis intercept, m is the gradient of the line, and I want to be very specific here. This value here is the label of the x-axis. x is just there to make the equation easy for us. If our x-axis is labeled time, then this value, that x, would have to read time. Likewise, label of my y-axis, if y was equal to height, then height is what you would actually write. Now, sadly, in mathematics, particularly further maths, and there are reasons for doing this that are again beyond the course. I actually Googled it. Why do we use a different form of the line? And there is lots of explanations about that. But in its simplest form, we actually, for further maths, have y equals a plus bx. Now, really, all we've done is taken y equals mx plus c, rearranged it to become c plus mx, and because, again, we wanted to, we changed the C to become A and the M to become B. So in this situation here, M and B are exactly the same. So that's the slope of the line. And C and A are exactly the same, which is the intercept on the y-axis. And as we see here, I've pretty much just done that for you there. Now, creating lines of best fit is really, really challenging, as I've said before. But your calculator does something pretty funky. How does it do it? Well, what it does is it looks at the difference between points that we've actually got and the line that it is trying to do. And you're going to say, that made no sense whatsoever. Maths guru, what are you talking about? Let's imagine I've got a final line of best fit, and it looks like that. And I've got lines above and below the axis at certain points here. Now what your graph or what your calculator does, it has some pretty funky math inside it to say, right, what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna zoom right the way in, I'm gonna change my pen color as well. So the first thing it's gonna do is say, right, I want to try and look at the distance between my actual value and my predicted value. Now the predicted value will be the value that lies on the line. Remember, here is an X value. Here is some sort of X value that gives me a Y value of descriptions, but I'm trying to find a line that goes through them. The chances of me hitting all of those points slim to zero, yeah, like slim to zero. But your calculator now says, I want to look at all of these distances and I want to make them the smallest I possibly can. Now, the way it does that is pretty funky. What it says is, I know that all of these distances here are positive values. So I'm gonna write here that that's a positive value, that's a positive value, and that's a positive value. And then it says, I know that all these distances here are negative values. Now, the calculator has a bit of a, oh, let's take that off, try that one again, and actually put the pen on, negative values. Now, your calculator has a bit of a problem, because if it puts this line perfectly right, then what's going to happen is when it adds all of these positive values together and all of these negative values together, then what it's going to end up with is going to end up with a value of zero. And that's no good to it because it doesn't matter where it puts the line, that's what's going to happen. So the calculator goes, well, hold on a moment, negative values aren't very useful to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of these negative values, these negative distances, and I'm going to square them. And in fact, it does that to all of the values because it can't do it to just one. It takes all of those distances and it squares them. Now, if you know anything about squared numbers, if you had minus two and you square it, you get four. If 
you get minus three and you square it, you get nine because a negative number that's squared becomes a positive number. And yes, when it takes all of these positive numbers, it's trying to make it so that it gets the smallest positive number it can in all the places it puts these graphs. Now again, funky maths the way it does it, really impressed. Do you actually need to know how to explain this for your exam? No, you can actually disregard it completely. What you do need to know that is critically important is that this distance here is called a residual because later on you're going to be working out residuals. Now, I can't say this enough. The residual is nothing more, and I'm going to write that down now. So your residual is equal to the actual value minus the predicted value. And again, zooming in really, really close to as much as we possibly can. Uh, let's choose blue as a different color. Here is my actual value, but here is my predicted value, yes? So my equation that I'm going to get later on isn't going to give me the actual value, it's going to give me the predicted value. And so our residual is really nothing more than an error. It's saying, well, give me the size or give me a value that tells me how far away from the line my actual value is. So i.e. tell me how far that really is. Again, what do you need to know? You need to know that the residual is equal to the actual value minus the predicted value. To be able to use least square lines, it is important that you know that there are three conditions that must be met. One, you assume the data is numerical, and I've seen this in exams. It will ask you for two of the three conditions or all three of those conditions, and it will say, it make sure that for this to be true and to be used, the data is numerical. The association is linear. The next chapter, we deal with nonlinear, and that there are no clear outliers. What on earth is an outlier? Well, in this situation here, if I had a data value all the way up there, then that's probably an outlier. Finding the equation of the least squares line is awesome because thankfully there are formulas that we can use. Now at this moment in time you're going to practice using these formulas, but later on your calculator is going to do it all for you. Now if you remember from earlier, we have the equation of a straight line as y equals a plus bx. Now wouldn't it be great if we could work out these values of a and b? Do I need to work out the values of x and y? Nope. Why? Because they're going to be on my graph. Changing pen color just a little bit, what do we know? Well, remember the value of x and y, or y and x, will already be given to you, so we don't need those, but we do need to find the value of a and b, which is my, if you remember, my intercept and my slope. And as if by magic, there are formulas to be able to do this. So, do you need to know where they came from? No. Do you need to learn them? Absolutely, I should cocoa. So, to find the value of b, you take r, you multiply it by s or y and divide it by s x. And you're going to go, huh, what is this all about? Well, basically, they'll give that to you in the question as well. If you remember, we've already met r. The value of r is the Pearson's correlation coefficient. s x is the standard deviation of our x values. And s y is the standard deviation of y values. And in the same way, as I've said here, a is equal to y bar minus b times x bar, where x bar is the mean of the x values and y bar is the mean of the y values. Now, I have seen this in exam questions over and over and over again. So make sure again, you learn this and understand how to do it. Now, sorry, before I scroll up, as I've said here, warning Will Robinson. Why is there a warning? Because what do you notice here? Well, you are working out a value of B, which you are then being asked to substitute in there. What if you make a mistake with a value of b? Well, not only will you get this here wrong, but then you will get this bit wrong as well. So you need to be very, very careful of your calculations and check, check, and check again. So, so important because you don't want to lose marks because of this. All right, let's have a look. How does this work in VCAR questions? Now again, I try and find VCAR questions that fit the contact area. There's not a lot of content in this at this moment in time. So here was a VCAR question. 
talked about equation of least square lines, right? So basically, here is an equation of least squared line, and we have the coefficient of determination of r squared as 0.875. Does this actually have anything to do with the price of fish? No. What is this residual business all about? Why is there a residual plot? Well, interestingly, this is all coming up. There is a lot of work to do in this chapter to make you help you understand how to do residual plots and all the stuff that you need to do to be able to write a decent analysis at the end. Your exam, your SACs, your projects will expect you to analyze data. Further maths isn't as easy as people think. Sadly, it is for you to realize how to use your calculator to manipulate some data to then be able to write about it sensibly. So actually this question, although I put it up there, wasn't necessarily particularly easy to answer until you've done the content. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause on this one and come back at the end of the course. Anything else in here? Same, same. Uh, again, this is very important in terms of uh, least squares regression lines but I'm gonna come back to the specific definitions of gradients as, as well. This question here, believe it or not, wanted you to make sure you understood what the actual gradient is. Now, a lot of people turn around, oh, it's rise over run. Yes, it is. But actually, it's about relating in words one unit of horizontal movement and what it means in terms of a vertical movement. You can't just write rise over run. You have to use some formal data here. And the least squares line is fitted to a set of bivariate data. Okay, which of the following statistics will not change the value? Again, I'm going to come back and do these three questions in a later video when we've done a little bit more of the work. Okay, so I'm going to call it a day for this one. What was that? That was effectively an introduction to least square regression lines. Yes, you can use a formula to work it out. The good news is, outside of this particular video, you won't need to because your calculator is going to do it all for you. Thumbs up for calculator usage. Now, if you haven't already done so, can you do me a favor, subscribe, leave me a comment if you found the video useful or if there is something you would like me to do instead. Um, but otherwise, I'm gonna continue recording, hopefully finish these videos at some time this week and upload them for you guys to watch. All right, take care, have a good day. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.